Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn some game theory. Today we're going to talk about the completeness preference axiom. So what does it mean for a preference relation to be complete? And remember that we're going over the preference rules that we need for game theoretical models to operate properly. These first two, completeness and transitivity, are how we define rationality, and so we'll be tackling the first half of that today. So let's get to it. Let's define completeness. We say that a preference ordering is complete if and only if, for any two outcomes, x and y, an individual prefers x to y, prefers y to x, or is indifferent between the two. So to see what that means, let's look at three of these outcomes right here. So we have winning a million dollars, winning zero dollars, and dying a painful death. We might say that an individual prefers winning a million dollars to winning zero dollars, so that's what this arrow means. This arrow runs from the more preferred outcome to the lesser preferred outcome. So the way I try to remember that is by looking at the point of the arrow. This is sort of forming a greater than sign, and the greater than sign is pointing at the more preferred outcome, winning a million dollars. Now, this preference relation, as stated, is not complete because we don't have any information about whether the person prefers a million dollars to dying a painful death or prefers winning zero dollars to dying a painful death. Now, obviously, a sensible answer would be to include things like this because, well, that's what a sensible person would say. I would have a hard time finding someone who would disagree with this preference ordering, but we actually need to have these arrows here. We can't just leave it blank like this. You actually have to draw everything out just like this. And actually, to be technical, a complete preference ordering also has indifference between its own outcomes, so uh, that was probably a little bit unclear, so t to show you what I mean by that, this right here, these two arrows are sort of forming a loop around winning a million dollars, which is trying to say that uh, if I prefer winning a million dollars, I have to be indifferent between that and winning a million dollars. So I have to be indifferent between winning a million dollars and winning a million dollars. That sort of goes without saying, it's, it's sort of unnecessary information. Now technically it has to be there, but we're just going to assume it's there for the rest of these videos. We're just gonna get rid of those extra lines and just make it look like this because that's a lot easier to work with. It's uh, less messy and it requires less work out of me to draw all of those extra ugly arrows going around in circles. So just pretend those things are there and we'll be good. Uh, one of the other points that I made in the last video is that rational, rationality is not the same thing in a game theoretical context as sensibility. We define linguistically in English uh, rationality to pretty much be a synonym with sensibility, but here we don't have that. We have rationality being defined in a different way, just as a complete and, pre uh, complete and transitive preference relation. So you could have something that looks like this, where dying a painful death has now become the most preferred outcome for this individual. They prefer dying a painful death to winning a million dollars to winning zero dollars, and they also prefer winning zero dollars to winning a million dollars. It's a little bit bizarre, but if someone had this preference relation, we actually would not have a hard time uh, studying their optimal behavior given that uh, in the context of a game theoretical model, as long as we actually just have a complete preference relation. That's not going to be a problem. Now, uh, one other thing that we need to cover is indifference. So that's what these double arrows here, where one arrow is pointing from win zero to dying a painful death, and the other arrow is drawn from dying a painful death to winning zero. I think the easiest way of remembering this is if you look at these two lines without the, the tips at the end, it sort of forms an equal sign. So this is like saying that you're equally uh, indifferent between winning zero dollars and dying a painful death. That's how I remember those sorts of things. Now. These were just three outcomes. It's pretty easy to draw preference relations between three outcomes, or you know, theoretically even any finite number of outcomes. But what if we deal with infinite, infinitely many outcomes? Can we actually come up with a complete preference relation with infinitely many outcomes? So the example I'm giving here is two countries bargaining over how to draw a border between them. You'll note that there's actually infinitely many places to draw that border. And so is this a problem? Can this preference ordering be complete? And the answer is yes. We just got to get creative with how we define the preference ordering. And so if you define it as some rule where that a country prefers outcome X to outcome Y, if X gives that country more land than Y, and is indifferent between those two outcomes if they uh, give the same amount, well then you've just created a rule that's going to, compl uh, going to create a complete preference relation despite the fact that we have infinitely many outcomes. Now you might be wondering why is it a problem if we have an incomplete preference relation. So this is an example of an incomplete preference relation. We have winning a million dollars being better than both winning zero dollars and dying a painful death, but we don't really have anything here. It's like saying, I don't know whether I prefer this or this. And if we have this I don't know sort of thing, well, let's look at this in an example that we've already covered. This is the prisoner's dilemma. I've replaced player one's payoffs when player two defects with question marks. This is like player one says, I don't know what happens if player two defects. I don't really know if I prefer cooperating or defecting in that outcome or in that case. 
And this is going to cause a problem because we know that player two is going to defect. Defect still strictly dominates cooperate for her in this game. That's because the zero is greater than this negative one and this negative five is greater than this negative ten. But given that player two is going to defect, well, now player one, what's going to happen here? Is player one going to cooperate or is he going to defect? And the answer is we just don't know. We have question marks there. This is going to cause problems. We can't, uh, we can't forecast. We can't... Uh, guess what player one's behavior is. We can't even tell what player one's optimal behavior is because he doesn't know what his optimal behavior is. So when you have these I don't know things, that's going to cause problems. And it should be noted that that's different than having these arrows here indicating indifference. Indifference is different between I don't know. This is saying I don't know. This is saying I'm indifferent. When you have it like this, this is saying I don't know whether I prefer zero dollars to dying a painful death. I don't know if I prefer dying a painful death to winning zero dollars. And I don't know if I'm indifferent between the two. And in contrast, this is explicitly saying that, well, you know that you're indifferent between these two things. Now, to wrap this up, uh, we should talk about if this completeness preference axiom is reasonable. And I think it is, just so long as the outcomes are actually important. And for an example of something that's unimportant, I honestly have no clue whether I would prefer wearing pink lip gloss or neon green eyeliner. I just don't know. That's something that I don't really think about. And if I don't really think about it, then I'm not going to be able to tell you whether I prefer one or the other, which is going to cause problems uh, when we are trying to predict what sort of behavior I'm going to display. You know, maybe if I really thought about it, I could come up with whether I would prefer one or the other, but that's just not something I really think about. So you can't expect uh, any sort of uh, deterministic behavior on my part, given this this knowledge that I don't really know what's going on between those two outcomes. So as such, we need to really think about modeling behavior that actors spend time thinking about. If they're not going to spend time thinking about these things, then we're not going to really be able to say sensible stuff about them from a rational choice perspective, or at least a traditional rational choice perspective. Now, I gave a pretty ridiculous example there with lip gloss and eyeliner, but a more reasonable example might be something about, uh, let's see, voting for a county water board supervisor. Now, I don't know about you, but I really don't spend very much time at all thinking about who would be an optimal county water board supervisor in my local county. Um, maybe you do, but I think it's safe to say that your average American doesn't. And if that's the case, well, I don't know how we're going to be able to uh, come up with some sort of rational account about what's going on with uh, county boards, county water board supervisor voting behavior. Um, so is that a big problem? Well, I don't really think it's that much of a problem because I'm only interested in describing behavior that's, like I said, important. That word right there comes up right there. I don't think who gets elected to county water board supervisor positions in the long term is actually very important. So that's not something I'm really interested in studying. I don't really think that this causes much of a problem uh, for me uh, when I'm when I'm researching in, in my particular field because I'm not going to be trying to answer those sorts of questions. But nevertheless, if you do encounter research where you have mundane behavior being described like that, mundane behavior like voting for a county water board supervisor, well, that's when I would start questioning whether what we're seeing in this model is actually going to be applicable to the real world because these people just aren't going to be thinking about these things. So why should we be able to expect a rational outcome uh, repeatedly from these sorts of models? I don't think we should. I don't think it's reasonable in that case, but I think in the cases that we should actually be concerning about, concerning ourselves about, I do think that uh, completeness is not a problem at all. So that wraps things up for here. And in the next video, we'll cover transitivity, which is the second half of how we define rationality. So I hope you join me then.